So a lot of people ask me how someone like me could be interested in going to space. And I think if I'm honest, it would be, my, my inspiration came from when I was much younger, and every Thursday I would watch my favorite show with my dad, which was Red Dwarf. <laughs> this is what inspired me to go to space. Watching the main character, if anyone's not seen it before, the main character, the last survivor member of the human race, is a guy from Liverpool, a scouser. And at the age of eight, I was mesmerized. I'd never seen anyone who sounded like me on TV before. And not only that, he was in space. And that's exactly what I wanted to do when I grew up. And so if you haven't seen, this is Dave Lister here. That was my inspiration. Now, telling people that you want to be an astronaut doesn't always go down so well. I remember at school being asked by our teacher what we wanted to be when we grew up. And I was so excited and confident to tell, them, tell her that I'd made my mind up and that I was going to be an astronaut. But the reaction that I got wasn't at all what I was expecting. When everyone started laughing and she told me to pick something more realistic, I couldn't quite understand what was so unrealistic about it. Why couldn't someone like me, someone from Liverpool, become an astronaut? So I kept this dream a secret, and I carried on regardless. But to be fair, I didn't really know how someone like me became an astronaut anyway. I genuinely thought that if I just worked hard at school, then maybe the government would scout me out somehow, how they would with like secret agents or something like that. And so that's what I did with the goal in mind of being scouted. I worked hard, and that hard work took me to university, where I studied maths. Now, doing a lot for my Liverpool community, which I was really passionate about, and getting good grades, I was able to get a John Lennon Memorial Scholarship, which enabled me to do a PhD in theoretical particle physics. Now, you're probably thinking that's quite far removed for someone who wants to be an astronaut. But actually, particles and their effects are something astronauts need to take into consideration and shield themselves against when working in space for long periods of time. On completing my PhD, however, I felt quite lost. The government hadn't come knocking. <laughs> I didn't know where to go to become an astronaut, and I was starting to believe that maybe that teacher was right, and that I started to be more, think of something more realistic to do with myself. Just as I was beginning to lose all hope, something amazing happened. Scrolling through Twitter, I came across this advert from the BBC looking for 12 men and women from across the UK to take part in mock astronaut selection. And I couldn't believe it. This could actually be my shot at seeing if I did have what it took to become an astronaut after all, and to prove that teacher wrong. So I showed my family and my friends the advert. And as I say, I was so excited. My mum and dad, they always think I'm quite random anyway, and I do all these random things. And they're like, yeah, we're supportive, and they're supportive of anything that I do. My friends, however, they laughed and they said, there's no way that you have the qualifications to do that. There's going to be people way better than you. And it's probably not a good idea to go on reality TV as an academic. It is career suicide. And although part of me agreed with them, I couldn't let this chance pass by. And so I have this motto in life that you can't win unless you put yourself in the runnings. And so I sent in my application anyway even though I was so scared of the rejection, and I was going to let fate decide. A, couple of, a month later, a couple of weeks later, I was called to the BBC for an interview. And I was already so excited, I'd never been to the BBC before. And so, if you haven't been like me, I was in a lift, going up to the top floor, and I was watching the news being filmed live. And I had a big smile on my face. The people who were escorting me around must have thought I was absolutely mad because I was so excited after just being in a building. I met my best friend Tess that day, who was an air, a commercial airline pilot. As we stood on one leg, trying to throw a tennis ball against the wall and catching it with one hand, we skipped as fast as we could while counting how many times the rope went past our face. We spoke to a psychologist, which is probably the scariest moment, telling them our deepest, darkest secrets. And the best bit was we worked as part of a team of people I'd never met before in my life, trying to assemble an IKEA chest of drawers with all of the instructions removed. <laughs> so this was definitely not going to be a day that I forgot anytime soon. 
couple of weeks later, and after supplying 10 years' worth of medical history, I got the phone call. I'd been picked as one of the final 12 to be part of Astronauts Do You Have What It Takes. And I was so nervous and so excited. This was going to be finally my chance to see if I could do it, if I could, all this stuff that I'd built up alongside my school and university, if it was going to be put in place and if it was going to prove to people that I could do what it took to become an astronaut. Now, astronaut selection is probably a bit more different than you think it is going to be. The tests were very, very difficult. The first test, for example, was that we had to hover a helicopter. Now, I don't know about any of you, but I'd never even been in a helicopter before, never mind flown one. And so after a mere two-minute demonstration, which was basically just some stick drawings on a flip chart, I was expected to get in and hover a helicopter for as long as possible. Now, I later found out that this task is very hard, and even experienced airplane pilots have trouble with mastering a hover of a helicopter. The task was not so much to see how quickly we could pick up this skill, but how well we dealt with failure because all of us failed. No one could do this task. Now, people think that being an astronaut means that you never fail, when it couldn't be more the opposite. You've learned to fail so many times, and you've learned to deal with failure so many times, that when the time counts, you'll get it perfect. And so a lot of the tests that we did had this kind of psychological angle. You weren't just being tested on what you thought you were being tested on. There was all these other things to take into consideration as well. I remember walking into a room and seeing Chris Hadfield for the first time. Now, he was one of my role models growing up, as the first Canadian astronaut at a time when Canada didn't even have a space agency, and former commander of the International Space Station. He was going to be the judge of whether I passed this test or not. I was already super nervous to begin with. Meeting one of your role models in real life, you know how nerve-wracking that is. And now having to show them that you had the skills that, that it took to become an astronaut was something else. The test was to be a memory test. But following the test, Chris came over to shake my hand, and he said, just remember how well you've done to get this far. And he just pointed to the door. And my heart sank. And I thought, that means that I've done really bad, and I'm going home. And I walked out into this corridor, and I'm stood there alone, no cameras, no one follow me, and I'm on the verge of breaking down. And my emotions were being tested. Not only in this test did we have to memorize a sequence of numbers and repeat it backwards, we had to do that while stepping on and off a step. Our memory was being tested, our ability to balance was being tested, and our ability to multitask was also being tested. And now I knew my emotions were being tested as well, to see where my breaking point was. Now, just as I was starting to get used to this, the test not being just what I thought it was and being much more than that, my worst fear happened. Pulling up next to a lake, those of us who remained piled off a minibus, and we went into a nearby building. On the desks in front of us were some papers lying face down. And when no one was looking and the cameras were away, I took a little sneak peek. On the top of the paper, it read, Underwater Helicopter Survival Experience. And I did not like the sound of that one bit. I don't think those words should ever be put together in a sequence, ever. And so... I was panicking. Dressed in what I can only describe as underwater helicopter survival experience gear, because <laughs> how else do you explain that? We had to get into this capsule, strap ourselves in, and wait as water started to fill up from our feet, fill a container, and when it got to about here, it was going to flip upside down and engulf us. The idea was that we were to push on this X and try to escape and swim to the surface. All the time, the vessel is sinking. Now, I should probably reveal something here that I never mentioned before. I never learned to swim. And so I'm in this container, 
No one has ever asked me on any forms or interviews or anything. And I'm not naive. I knew that to be an astronaut, you did a lot of your training underwater. But you're in a suit, right? It's not the same as swimming. It's kind of more like diving. And so I thought I'd maybe just get away with it. So I'm in this container. I've not told anyone I can't swim. And I've signed a form to say that I'm, confident, I'm a confident swimmer. Because what else do you do? I was like, either I do it or I go home now, and I might as well try. You never know. I'd never put my head under the water before, and I was terrified. So this is a picture taken just before the water covers my face. And as it hit my face, I was so shocked, I breathed in. So with lungs full of water, my eyes scrunched up, panicking to try to get out and unbuckle my seatbelt. I couldn't see, I couldn't breathe. And now as I was trying to get out in all of this clothing, I realized I definitely couldn't swim. So I'm bobbing up to the surface and struggling to get there, coming back down again, choking. I, I genuinely could not breathe. And someone grabs me and pulls me up. I open my eyes and all I see is a mustache. <laughs> and Chris Hadfield, former commander of the International Space Station, had dived in to rescue me from drowning. And I was mortified. <laughs> the only thing worse than this was that they used that scene of me coughing and spluttering for the opening credits for all six episodes. <laughs> so every week I got to relive that moment. I think the worst part of that was I got out of the pool and no one said a word. No one gave me any instructions or told me what to do next, which could only mean one thing. I had to get back in and I had to do it again. And I did three more times. Chris told me off after that for doing something that astronauts would never do. And that has put myself and my crew in danger. Now, if this was a real-life scenario and we were in a sinking vessel, the worst thing to do would be to try to escape before the pressure was equalized inside. What I should have done was stay there until the water had filled the cabin, very calmly sat there waiting, and then pushed the window open. Because I forced the window open quicker, it would have forced the water to come in faster, and it would have made the vessel sink much faster than that as well. And that would have put everyone's lives in danger. On the other hand, he commended me on my bravery and said that I'd been courageous, although I felt anything but brave that day. And I think underwater task took its toll on me, really, because weeks later, I was walking down the street and there was a spider on the floor in front of me. Now, usually, I would scream and run a mile because I was petrified. And today, it was different. I just stood there and all fear was gone. And I thought, that was really weird. So I phoned the show psychologist to ask what, what was going on. And they said that what had happened was I'd been so scared that my brain thought that I was going to die. And after speaking to the producers after, they told me that they'd almost pulled the plug on that test because they thought that my heart rate monitor, which we were wearing, had gone so high I was going to go into cardiac arrest. And so my brain had reassessed all fear at that moment. And anything that it deemed to be irrational, it's thrown away. So I always make a joke to people when they say that they're scared of spiders, and I say, it's all right, just put all this gear on, dunk yourself in, you'll be fine, you won't be scared anymore. <laughs> but the following tasks, I managed to pass with flying colors, which was really lucky. We got to pilot this Mars rover, the prototype Mars rover down in Airbus, um, a task that Tim Peake himself had done from the International Space Station. We got to take our own blood, and we got to sit in a small sphere in the dark while trying to lace our boots up and count to exactly 20 minutes. Unfortunately, though, the next task involved getting back in the pool. The task was to swim two lengths in our full flight suit and shoes and tread water for 12 minutes, something that I just couldn't do. And so, unfortunately, it was my time to go home. And for the weeks and months that followed before the show came to air, I felt like an absolute failure. I felt like I'd let my city down, everyone down who believed in me, and everyone who'd said I couldn't do it, I would have proven them right. And I was, I was so close to almost giving up forever. Now, when the show aired, 
I watch the behind closed hands. People think that we, we, if you're on TV, you get to see the episodes beforehand. It's not always the case. I was watching this live with everyone else. I was reliving this trauma with everyone else. And the episode had come where I was about to go. And I felt like my whole city had been behind me up until that point. And everyone was going to give me so much grief for not being able to swim. A skill that so many people take for granted. Now, as I was waiting for the criticism to come in, it didn't. I was overwhelmed with messages from people, people I'd never met before, who'd found me on social media to congratulate me on how brave and courageous I'd been. And even though I was super, super embarrassed and felt so ashamed, I guess all around the city, all around the country, I'd inspired people to be motivated to go and learn to swim. And people were even messaging me to offer me free swimming lessons as well, which is great. And I took them off on that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I put my faith back into in humanity. And I think even though I left the show halfway through, this meant more to me than anything. The fact that parents had messaged me and said, seeing you face your fear like that made me go out and book swimming lessons. And this summer, I'm going to swim for the first time with my kids on holiday. And I was proud of that. Despite all of the embarrassment of drowning on national TV, I was really proud that I'd changed a few people's lives. So now, halfway through my pilot's license, and doing Russian and all of these other things that I think it takes to be an astronaut, I still have that dream of becoming an astronaut one day. And joining Dave Lister as the second Scouser in space. I think being on the show, it showed me that although before I thought I was confident, I don't think I ever truly was. I didn't have any self-worth. I let all of the things that people tell me about it not being possible get to me. And I believed them. And I think it's hard because you, you want to protect people by saying, oh no, maybe go to a different university or go for a different job or this is more your level. And in a way, you're trying to protect them. But I think it's important that we don't, we don't always do that, because it's important that we have more people that sound like us in these positions. You know, why can't we be just as good and, and be, be space scientists or, you know, work in Parliament or any of these places? And so I think my key message is that I genuinely believe that anyone can be anything that they want to be. If you put in enough effort and you're really passionate about what you want and you don't let people and your, these barriers get in your way, everyone has their own barriers and I respect that some people have bigger barriers than others. But if you understand those barriers and you get through them, it will only help build your resilience and bring you closer to your dream. Thank you.